I'm glad everybody's here tonight. My name's Matt. Um, uh, my wife and I moved out here to this beautiful part of the country two years ago to help um, get this side of Elements Church uh, up and running, and it has been a joy. We have, we have loved being a part of it. Um, yeah, it's good, and we're excited that you guys are here. Tonight, um, tonight we're going to talk about joy, about happiness. Now, earlier, my, most of my family's home sick tonight, so they're not here, or they're sick of hearing me preach. It's one of the two. Um, but I was talking to my wife, Misty, and I, and I said, you know, I go, it's really kind of awkward. For me, I feel awkward, right? We're talking about joy. We're talking about happiness tonight. Yet our, our nation is struggling with some really deep-seated issues um, that we can't seem to get over. But God knows what he's doing, right? And so I think that tonight the message is, I think, timely because our joy does not come out of things we have or what we do, right? Skiing is fun. Right? It's fun. We enjoy doing that. I like hiking. I love snow. I don't like combining the two, so I don't ski. I will hike in jeans, but you know, I think that's okay. But, but God is our source of joy, right? So we're going to get into some of that tonight. But as I was preparing for this, I found that August, one, I didn't know that every month of the year, there's like different things that uh, they... I don't know, honor or whatever in that month. So August is actually called the Happiness Happens Month. Now, I grew up in Missouri in the Midwest. I hated August because it's like 100 degrees in Missouri right now. You know, I'm like, my family calls and they're like, oh, how things are going? I'm like, it's great. I mean, it's like 69 degrees outside and like I'm wearing long sleeve shirt because I'm cold and they're like, oh, it's like 500 degrees here. I hated August. So I found it interesting. I'm like, happiness month. August is happiness month. Here, I get that. When I lived in Mississippi, I did not get that. That was even worse. But there's some other things, right? So August is also the American Adventures Month, right? So it's like celebrating vacations and everything. That works perfect for us. We've got plenty of adventure um, opportunities and things here just within our county. August is also National Black Business Month. Again, did not know this. I'm like, that's cool, right? It's also the National Immunization Month. Which I get that, because like school's starting back up, right? And you don't want your kids going to school with like rabies or, you know, they're like foaming at the mouth and their teacher's like, oh, it's you again, you know, kind of thing. So I understand that one. It's also National Dippin' Dots Month. I'm like, I can get down with that. Okay. For, I, thought, I was telling Robert about this earlier, thought of him. It's also National Catfish Month. I don't like catfish. My family does. Robert says he thinks my mom dropped me on my head or something when I was little. That's very possible, but I don't think that's why I don't like catfish. So I think it's interesting, right? So God put this idea on my heart to talk about joy, and yet we're in the month where it's National Happiness Month. Today itself, August 13th, is National Left-Handed nose picker or something day so who <laughs> Jillian's excited about that we all know if she if you ever go shake her hand you don't want to shake her left hand because obviously that's the picking hand right there but who who here is left-handed okay today <laughs> she's like I just switched like in my brain I flipped it I'm now right-handed right so today we celebrate you for being able to use your left hand. That's, that's awesome. They say we use like, what, 10% of our brains, and then those who are left-handed only use like 7%? Is that how? No, maybe that's not it. So I thought about happiness, right? I, I try to live a life, and I try to be happy. I try to be joyful. Um, so I was like, so I'm going to start at the service by telling some jokes, right? Jokes are fun. They're happy. I'm going to warn you I'm a little weird when it comes to jokes. So you might be like, 
Well, that's not funny. You'll definitely learn a couple things tonight. One, about me, you'll be like, well, he's probably super weird. Um, his jokes are probably not very good. I promise they're not off-color jokes. So this was like 15 pages long. I was like, I took out those jokes, and now it's only like seven. So we're good. But the first one I came with, I asked my kids, you know, what's your favorite joke? My youngest boy, Kai, who's not here tonight, he, he said he made one up. Let's see if I write this one down right. He said, uh, said why, didn't, why didn't the duck cross the road? I said, why? He goes, because he was raised by chickens. It's like, okay. I like that one. That's, that's a good one. Um, he also told me I like Chuck Norris jokes, right? I mean, who doesn't like Chuck Norris to begin with and then jokes on top of that? So he was like, he told this one about Chuck Norris. He says, Jesus can walk on water and Chuck Norris can swim on land. Like, Dig that. I like, I like that one. Another one that I personally like says that, you know, Chuck Norris likes playing games, but he doesn't play hide and seek. He plays hide and pray I don't find you. So it's good to laugh, right? I mean, there's just, there's something about laughing that it just changes our demeanor. It, it changes our outlook of things. There's just this little bit of joy that kind of wells up inside of us. We watch funny movies and, and, and our day could have just been horrible beforehand. And we sit down and we watch it and, and afterwards we're like, you know what? It just, things seem to be a little bit better. It's good to laugh. Proverbs 17, 22 says that happiness is good medicine, but sorrow is a disease. I'll choose the happiness side of that, right? It's good medicine. Nehemiah 8, 10 says the joy of the Lord. This is at the very end. So if you flip to your Bible and you're like, verse 10 doesn't start with the joy of the Lord. You just have to get to the bottom. It says the joy of the Lord will make you strong. It's good to have a joyful demeanor, right? But unfortunately, we all know that we live in a broken world. We live in a world that is full of heartache and sadness and, and tragedy, and it impacts our lives directly and indirectly. And so I started to look. I'm like, so what makes us as Americans happy? And there's surveys and statistics for everything, um, including this. And so I got to looking, and the first thing was health. Health is the, the number one thing that affects a person's happiness. It says in the survey that I was reading by some fifth grader that uh, says healthier people are 20% happier than unhealthy people. Now, we, here in Summit County, we ha live in a pretty healthy county. Um, we're very active people. We enjoy the community we live in and the mountains, and we love to hike and run. Running is a sin. Tyler? Um, we like to, to run, and Jesus didn't run. Just throw that out there, Tyler. Um, and, and go biking and, I mean, all this fun stuff, paddle boarding and everything. And, the, and here in like a week and a half when we have like three feet of snow on the ground, um, people are going to be skiing and, and snowboarding and, and snowshoeing and, and making snowmen and all of that kind of stuff. But we're an active community, right? And because of that, we're a... We're a pretty healthy community. We love where we live and we like to enjoy that. This next thing that I found on the survey said that healthy or uh, happy people, things that make them happy, is marriage. Now, I am a married man. My wife and I, we have been married for 17 years, going on 18 years. I know, she has put up with a lot. They said that marriage, they said that people who are married are 10% happier than people who have never been married before. In a, in a different survey, reading it, it's kind of took the idea of marriage and, and just kind of married it, see what I did there, with uh, just community, right? Having good, healthy friendships, that people are happier when they're involved in a good, healthy friendship or a good, healthy marriage. Income came into the picture as well, right? It says that people who make a higher income are about 3.5% happier. And I was like, 3.5%, not a big deal, right? I don't know why that's 
in the list, but every single one of us here would be happy with a three and a half percent raise at work. I know I would, right? So people that have higher income, they say that they are happier people. I don't know. I even found one, I even found one survey that said that people who have children, that their happiness is reduced by 0.24% per child. I, so I don't know what's like the questions or how they ask or how they even come up with 0.24%. So I'm like, I mean, I'm up to like 0.72% less happy because I have three kids or something, you know? And so I was thinking about it, and I'm like, well, this, that's not right. I love my kids. I love my family. I mean, they're, they're the pride of, of who, who I am. But then I found that, in spite of it sounding crazy, it costs parents an average of $233,000 to raise one kid from birth to age 17. Yeah, I, I almost vomited when I read that one. You know, if they say it's like it's $14,000 per child per year. So doing the math, Misty and I are up to like $580,000 that we've thrown at our children. So I'm like, whenever I'm asking, where did our money go to? I know now our kids have taken it all. But you see, it says, so it's like, 18% of this whole lot of money here um, goes to food, right? 29% to housing here in Summit County. That's probably more like 51%. Um, 15% for transportation, 9% for health care, uh, 6% for clothing. And then you've got 16% for uh, education and child care. And then 7% for miscellaneous. I know what the miscellaneous is. It's like ice cream and candy and stuff that they don't need, but they're at the store and they're like, I want this. And you're like, I want them to stop. And so you buy that stuff for them, right? So Misty and I, I'm, I was looking at this and I'm like, I understand now the happiness being reduced by 0.24%, right? Per kid. Because it's expensive. It's crazy. Like London, his, his list of school supplies, okay? If I spit on you in the front row, bless you. Um, it, you know, it has like boxes of tissues, right? And pencils and paper and bottles of whiskey for the teachers. And I mean, all this. I mean, it is, it is unbelievable how pricey things are. And as I was looking through and reading through all of these different surveys and whatever, I found it interesting so the things in America, what they classify as what makes us happy in America, compared to how we look on things on a global scale, it's really different, right? So middle to lower income countries that are rated a happier than what we are here in America. So like the number one like happiest country in the world is Indonesia. It says that they're rated at like 90% happy. I'm like, wow, that's awesome, right? Because 53% of their population lives below the poverty line. Yet it's the happiest country in the world. You know, it's followed up by Nigeria and then India for the top three happiest countries in the world. America comes in seventh place. Once you get to the bottom, you find countries like France and the UK. Nathan, sorry, man. Bad news for you but they have like 57% happiness. I mean, France, I get that, but the UK, I don't. Anyway, so then you have like New Zealand, that's only like 50% happy. I'm like, I love the Lord of the Rings. How could they not be happy there in New Zealand, right? And then it, it's like f finished all the way down at the bottom by Japan, which is like 28% happy. I'm like, well, it's, it's kind of crazy, but the things that we take into consideration or what we think that brings happiness and joy into our life is maybe not what really brings happiness, right? Maybe it's not about health and community and wealth that makes the world go round. So I thought, you know, if we live in a happy country, a happy county, then why is it that 
suicides have increased by 25% in America since 1999. The national average is 13 people per 100,000. The state of Colorado, it's 19.4. Summit County, it's 22.3. Twice the national average in our community. But we're supposed to live in this happy, joyful world. So maybe the materialistic things and, and, and maybe the, the alcohol abuse and drug abuse and sex abuse, maybe all of those things is not really what's bringing happiness into my life if we still have this void in our county, in our community, in our world. August might be the happiness happens month, but friends, there's a real threat going on in our world. The devil is hard at work to try and steal our joy and take our happiness. First Peter 5, 8 says, the devil is your enemy and he goes around like a roaring lion looking for someone to attack and eat. And I don't know about you, but being attacked and eaten doesn't sound like fun. Right? It doesn't sound joyful. It, it also shows me that the devil obviously is a zombie. So there's that to clarify. John 10.10 10 says, the thief, again, talking about the devil, says the thief comes or the thief approaches with malicious intent, looking to steal, slaughter, and destroy. I came to give life with joy and abundance. So how can we have joy? How can we have happiness in a society that still struggles with hatred? Well, I think that a few ways that we can find this joy and live this out, one is by first recognizing the source of our joy. Throughout Scripture, you see uh, descriptions of joyful times by, it talks about singing and shouting, not like angry shouting, but like shouts of joy, dancing and playing musical instruments. These are descriptive descriptors that we have of what it was like to be joyful. And why? Because they were celebrating who God is, right? They were celebrating what God has done for his people. And friends, we are God's people. We are a part of God's family. Isaiah 30, 29 says, but you will sing Sing through an all-night holy fest. I just like the sound of that, right? An all-night holy fest. It kind of reminds me of like what our vigils are. You know, maybe we need to, I mean, I love praying, but I mean, let's get some music on and get, dan- I can get my finger dancing going. I twerk pretty well. We do that also, right? For Jesus. Twerking for Jesus. Who's with me? Robert? No? Okay. Well, I'm just trying to include... It says, but you will sing, sing through an all-night holy fest. Your hearts will burst with song. Make music like the sound of flutes on parade en route to the mountain of God on the way to the rock of Israel. With all the partying that comes along with joy, it's important for us to remember that our happiness comes from God. It's not something that I can go buy at the store or have delivered to my house that, that gives me this sense of joy. The source of it comes from God. In the New Testament, we see joy first introduced through the birth of Christ. Matthew 2, 9 through 10, it says, The wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. I'm talking about Jesus here. When they saw the star, they were filled with with joy. Through all the surveys that I read, what we found, what I found that determined joy was all based on external factors. It was money and possessions and looks. But God says that our joy isn't found in these things. It's not external things that brings joy, but it's our internal connection with Him. That's where our joy, that is our source of joy. 
And we say, I'm happy, right? Because I'm in love. I love my wife. I love my kids. But I mean, I still love them even when my kids are being disobedient, when they're not listening. Are you listening, Ellie? Okay. When my wife and I are fighting, which we work really hard to not do, but I mean, we're two different people, right? It happens. I try to tell her, I mean, somebody has to be wrong, right? But I mean, it's, that's when I find out that I'm wrong. Um, but we, we say that, you know, I'm happy because I'm in love or I'm happy because I'm financially stable or I'm happy because I've got a, a great job or, or I'm, I'm, I'm popular. I've got a million followers on Instagram or, I mean, whatever it is, we, we attribute our happiness to all of these external things. But the reality, friends, is that all of that, all it's going to do is bring us temporary happiness. And it's not actually going to bring us what true godly joy is is God is the source of our joy. The second thing that we can that we can do to have a joyful life is that we need to control our thoughts. Philippians 4 verses 8 and 9 says, "Finally, fill your minds with beauty and truth. Meditate on whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely." whatever is good, whatever is virtuous and praiseworthy. Keep to the script whatever you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. Do it, and the God of peace will walk with you. I love this verse because it does such a great job of describing how we are to think, right? Where our thoughts are supposed to be. We have to have control. And if we, if we take these verses, right, and we apply them to our life, and even Gandhi had a, had a statement here. I think I skipped over it really quick. But Gandhi said that basically if we, in controlling our thoughts, that it's, it's what we think about, it's what we say, and it's what we do, that when those are in harmony, oh, here we go. Yeah, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. When we have that, when we take scripture verse like this in Philippians and we're looking at the idea of of things that are honorable, when we're thinking about that, when we're thinking about what is right and what is pure and what is true and what is lovely and what is virtuous and things that are praiseworthy, when that becomes what our minds meditate on, friends, then that's what we're going to talk about. Right? And the things that we talk about are the things that we take action on. And these will be the characteristics, friends, that define who we are. I mean, when we talk to people, right? When I, since moving out here, I've, I've had, God only knows how many interviews with different jobs and, and, and everything like that. And in all of them, people want to know, like, well, describe yourself. Right? Hi, I'm Matt. I mean, I feel like I'm like, you know, it, it was like, hi, I'm Matt. You know, I'm... I'm I'm fun and happy and I mean I do stuff. You know I mean I it's 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 odd because how people know how I describe myself compared to how somebody else describes me is often different. You know what I look at and the lens that I see myself through, I see all my faults and all my failures and and so when someone's like, "Well, describe yourself." I mean, I lead with that and I'm like, "I'm a liar." and I'm a cheat, and you're ugly, and, you know, we start, I start into this list, but, but if we control our thoughts, friends, like, if, if what we think about is good and honorable, if it's right, if it's for justice, if it's for all of these things, then, friends, what we're doing, or what we're talking about, and what we're doing is going to be a representation of that. Job chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. And I think it's interesting, right? Because Job, the whole story of Job was awful. For those of you who know it, I mean, God agreed to allow Satan to just wreck this dude's life. I mean, it was bad. All the things that he went through. And we find here in chapter 8, it says, and this I believe was his friend talking to him, he says, but look, God will not reject a person of integrity, 
nor will he lend a hand to the wicked. He will once again fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. And you're like, how can that be? How can that be in a country that still struggles and deals with racism and hatred and bigotry? How is it that we can have a mouth full of laughter and joy? I don't see how that can happen. But friends, what it comes down to is, it comes down to integrity. Integrity is the quality of our mortality, right? And our mortality is living out the characteristics of Christ. And our, our mortality, friends, it all starts with our thoughts, because that's where it begins. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all, be careful what you think about. Why? Because your thoughts control your life. Think about that for a minute. Your thoughts control your life. So, so let's take a moment and let's do a little self-evaluation here. If my thoughts control my life, what are my thoughts? All right, what takes up my time? What am I thinking about often? When I get angry, what are the thoughts that come to mind right there? Is it compassion? Is it mercy? Is it forgiveness? Or is it rage and anger because Starbucks didn't get my order right? Our thoughts, friends, our thoughts control our life. And if we want to live a life of joy and a life of happiness, then we need to have control over what we're thinking about. The third thing that we can do, that we can put into practice to have a life of joy is that we need to take time to process. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 4 says, There is a time to cry and a time to laugh. There is a time to be sad and a time to dance with joy. Think of the contrast that we find in that scripture there. You know, living a joyful life doesn't mean that we're not going to encounter difficult issues. It doesn't mean that, that our life is going to be free of tough decisions and tough conversations and find ourselves in hard times. It doesn't mean that we'll be able to live a life without any of that. When we are born into this world, we've got to remember, guys, we're born into a sinful world. We're born into a broken world. And because of that sin, we're going to have hard days. Because of that sin, there's going to be discrimination. Because of that sin, there's going to be death. Because of that sin, mankind, you and I, were separated from God. Completely separated. Why? Because God cannot be where sin is. But the great thing, and for us what is awesome, is that the story doesn't end right there, right? God loved us enough. John 3.16 says, this is in the message version, but it says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son, His one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. Our sin has separated us from God. But Jesus came down to this earth and He took the punishment for us. And because of that, then that bridge was created back to God. Through Jesus' actions, we can have a real relationship with God. Psalm 30, verse 11, it says, You did it. You turned my deepest pains into joyful dancing. You stripped off my dark clothing and covered me with joyful light. Friends, there's going to be pain that we're going to experience in this life. But if we take time to stop, to slow down, and process the challenging days, process through forgiveness, process through unforgiveness, process through deep hurts, remembering what God has done for us, then we can come out on the other side of it and still have joy in our life. It's not those difficult, hard, dark days that 
determines if we have joy or not. It's not those moments that's going to strip away the joy that we do have. We can still have it even in the midst of really hard, trying times. The last thing that we can learn and put into practice to be able to live a joyful life is learn to work from rest. And for those of you that call Elements Church your home, we have a lot of language that we use, Pastor Lila and Pastor Eric, that they use talking about uh, us as disciples. We use language like this, working from rest. And we find in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26, it says, Then God said, now let's make humans who will be like us. They will rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air. They will rule over all large animals and all the little things that crawl on the earth. So God created humans in his image. He created them to be like himself. He created male and female. God blessed them and said to them, have many children. That sounds great, right? Until you buy school supplies, remember? And then that 0.24% comes into play. I lost my place. Eeny, meeny, miny. Have many children. There we go. Thanks. We're getting there. Have many children. Fill the earth and take control of it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Rule over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, I am giving you all the grain-bearing plants and all the fruit trees. These trees make fruit with seed in it, the grain, um, and fruit will be your food. I am giving all the green plants to the animals. Those green plants will be their food. This, we're not going to get into this whole, like, are you a vegetarian or do you eat meat? We're not doing that. I'm going to have a steak afterwards. But anyway... Um, I'm giving all the, the, the green plants and everything to, to the animals so that they can eat, all those crawling around. So we jump down to verse 31 here and it says, God looked at everything that he had made and he saw that everything was very good. This was the evening and then the morning, this was the sixth day. So we're into chapter 2 now. Verse 1 says, So the earth, the sky, and everything in them were finished God finished the work he was doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it a holy day. He made it, it, he made it special because it was the day that he rested from all the work he did while creating the world. That was probably a busy week for God. Okay, I go to work, and I work 40, 45 hours a week, and I come home, and I'm like, I am tired. Exhausted. I don't know how God did it, right? You know? So God created the world, all that stuff, and then he rested. So I'm like, okay, well, if I'm supposed to work, or I'm from rest, but what I'm seeing here is God was like, worked and did all this crazy stuff and created this super cool world, right? And then he rested. I'm a little confused. And then God was like, yeah, but you're not me. Like, good point. I'm not God. I'm just a human being. I'm extremely limited on what I can do. And so we see that Adam and Eve, their first day on the farm was a day of rest. God said, take it easy. Take some time to rest. Why? Because they needed to be able to build up the strength to do all the things that was expected of them. We go through a book here, we call it Building a Discipling Culture. Our huddles come out of that, which are our discipleship groups here at Elements Church. And through that, in one of the chapters, it's the semicircle is the, if we got the picture, here we go. The semicircle, right? This is the pattern that we are trying to develop between working and resting, right? Abiding with God and the fruitfulness that comes out of that. And you see the pendulum here that it's swinging. This isn't an Edgar Allan Poe type of pendulum thing. Um, But we go through our time spent with God, that resting, that regaining our strength, and then we're pruning things, cutting back in areas that we don't need or things we just need to get rid of. And we're growing as we go around to work. But the pattern is not working or it's not resting from our work. It is working from rest. Mike Breen said this in in this book, 
building a discipling culture, he says, rest is vitally important. As a matter of fact, rest from our activities is listed in God's top 10. The commandment that uh, to keep the Sabbath is right up there with don't kill, don't steal, and don't commit adultery. In other words, being a workaholic is to God just as bad as being a murderer or an adulterer. Rest is not an option if we are to walk in the lifestyle of a disciple. Rest is without a doubt important to our lives. I mean, if we want to live a, a joyful life, we have to develop healthy rhythms of rest. And when, think about it. When, when you've had an extremely busy, hectic week, right? And you're working nonstop, and there's not a lot of downtime for you to rest or just catch your breath or anything like that. What happens? We get exhausted, right? We get extremely tired. And then from that, we get easily frustrated. You know, it's like, I'm tired. My kids come up, dad, dad, this, that, and everything. And I'm like, I'm tired. Just leave me alone. I have already spent enough money on you. So, you know. And then our frustrations leads to us being short-tempered with people. And then, and then all of a sudden, our responses to things become very sloppy. And just our life in general becomes messy. Why? Because we're not taking time to rest. But for us to rest, friends, we've got to understand what that means for each of us, okay? So to begin with, Resting doesn't mean like sitting down and playing 10 hours of PlayStation or vegging out on Netflix. That abiding and fruitfulness, right? Rest for us, we have to spend time with God. We have to spend time abiding with Him. We can't, we can't order our, our joy or our strength or any of that stuff on Amazon Prime and have it delivered to our door in two days, that's not how it works. And I'm glad, I'm glad it doesn't work that way because if it did, it would probably all come through like the USPS, right? And you'd actually never get your joy in the mail. Or you would get an empty box. And you're like, where's my joy? And they're like, I don't know. I just work for the post office, you know, kind of thing. For us to have rest for us to gain that strength we need during that time we have to spend time with God that doesn't mean that we just on our days off or whatever that we just go home and like sit in a corner and hide out and and pray for 900 hours or whatever you know God is intermingled into our life and into our likes and dislikes and the things that we enjoy and all of that and so for some of us you know, you might be energized by spending time with other people. I'm that way. So on my days off, I love spending time with my wife. I even like spending time with my kids. It energizes me, it, and, and I can do that, and we can go do things and hike and, and, and hunt down as many ghost towns as we want and all that stuff, and in spite of it being busy, I can still come out of that and be restful. For some of you, you might be like, I want to go hide away for like 900 hours and not be around people. You know, we've got, to, we've got to figure out who we are and where we fit into things, okay? Am I an extrovert or am I an introvert? We've got to look at all of these different makeups of who we are. But the point is this, when we figure out those things and we find what we really enjoy, what we would consider restful, for me sometimes it's just going for a drive. But the reality is, if God's not with me, I'm not going to truly get the rest I need because I'm missing out on the integral part of rest. It's abiding. It's spending that time with God. So you might say, you know what? I don't need to be around a bunch of people. For me, it's good to get away for a few hours and, and just pray, right? Just put some worship music on and spend that time with God. Or, and then take the rest of the day and go do something by myself. That's awesome. The point is we have to begin to understand what is restful for us when we're spending time with God. And then we've got to be able to cultivate those healthy rhythms. Confucius said that 
life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. How true is that for you? How true is that for me? That I can understand these things. If I want to be joyful and if I want to have happiness in my life and and it just radiate off of me when I'm around other people and and have that impact their life, I've got to be able to I've got to be able to put some of these things into practice. I can't complicate things. Sometimes I've just got to look at them for what they are. I've got to remember that if I want to have a joyful, happy life, I've got to remember where the source of that is, that it is in God only. I've got to control my thoughts. I've got to take time to sit back and process through things and not just try to battle my way through life and through difficulties and not thinking about why or how to actually process that. Right? We call those our, these are our Kairos moments, right? And we have this thing that stands out, glaring us in the face, and we stop and we look at it and we figure out what God is saying to us and what we're going to do about it, right? We've got to take time to process through that, and we have to develop rhythms, healthy rhythms of rest. Friends, if we want to have a joyful life, and we can, this is not something that is unattainable for us. It is, because God designed us to have joy. God designed us to be happy people, even in the midst of hard times. We can still have that. But friends, we've got to put some things into priority. We've got to cut out that whole pruning business. We've got to cut out things that we don't need or things that are just not healthy for us. 